So, thank you very much, uh, Elena. And uh, most of all, thank you all for coming to this talk. Uh, my talk today is about ethics, and another meaning of ethics is moral philosophy, and effectively a code of values. Now, the problem with this subject is that different people have different opinions about what should be the code of values. And philosophy itself is a very diffuse subject, so many people can have different opinions about the meaning of ethics. So it's very important that today we don't treat this just like a lecture, but I want you to participate. Okay? So I will, I will pose some questions throughout the lecture, and you should feel happy to answer those questions. Uh, and you can answer them in Russian, because uh, my colleagues uh, Evgenia and uh, um, Anastasia and uh, Titania will translate them into English and put some information on the board. So I want at least three people in the audience to answer any question that I pose, and if there are more, that's even better. Okay? So this is not like a normal lecture. You should interrupt me during the course of the lecture and not feel shy about doing that. Okay? So we will bring a microphone to you when you want to ask a question. Everybody happy with that? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so uh, ethics is uh, a philosophy and a code of values, and the code of values will depend on different countries, different perspectives within a single country, and so on. So it's a very difficult subject to cover. And today, the focus is on engineering and science, okay? because ethics can be in law, it can be in many different subjects, like religion, it's a very strong point of uh, ethics. But today, the focus is only on science and engineering. Okay, so um, there are two characteristics of ethics. One is that you can be very objective. Uh, objective, that means the principles are defined in law. For example, you cannot go and murder somebody. That is a law, and you have to obey it, because that's what your society says. And the second thing is uh, subjective. That means uh, that you ask yourself the question, am I doing the right thing? Does my conscience tell me it is the right thing to do? And one classic example of this is, you know, if, you are, if your country is at war and you don't think the war is right, then would you be forced to fight in that war or can you object on the basis of your conscience? Okay? So this is just a definition of the broad definition of ethics, that there are some things which are completely objective and you're not allowed to do in law, and if you do that, there will be some consequences. And the second one is much more difficult, which is you ask yourself the question, am I doing the right thing? All right? And this time we are focusing on science and engineering, so I will give you examples where scientists uh, have to ask themselves, are they doing the right thing? And then I will ask you whether they are doing the right thing or not. Okay, now, you will have heard this many, many times, that the temperature of the Earth will rise by 2 degrees centigrade in the next seven years, right? So very important, in the next seven years, if we carry on like we do right now. Now, what is the importance of a 2 degrees centigrade rise in temperature? Well, first of all, once we get to 2 degrees, it is irreversible. That means the temperature will continue to rise. There is nothing we can do to stop it from rising, right? because it's a, it's a catastrophe. If it's 1.5 degrees, it's possible for us to do something, but we have to do that in a 7-year time scale. Now, the consequence of a 2 degrees centigrade rise in temperature is that you will have massive areas of land covered with water that will affect hundreds of millions of people's lives. There will be unpredictable weather and some very, very hot temperatures which will destroy crops and cause starvation. Uh, so that would be for the most poor people 
in the world, right? So there is a matter of conscience here. So the governments throughout the world, including Russia, I heard yesterday that uh, Russia is devoting six trillion rubles to a new project on controlling the environment. Six trillion rubles, all right? So that's uh, something of the order of six billion dollars, maybe. Sixty billion dollars. And that's not just Russia. Many countries in the world, apart from perhaps the USA, <laughs> uh, are going to try and do something about this because it's, it could become an irreversible uh, problem. So the government is going to put in large quantities of money, all right? And it's up to universities to propose research, right? To propose research which will lead to a solution that means we don't get a temperature rise greater than two degrees over the next seven years. So can somebody tell me what kind of idea you have which might help to solve the problem? So can you translate that into Russian? Yeah, so I can, I can see somebody talking over there. Um, I think that we need to change our fuel cars from the electric. Fuel cars, right? Yeah, automotive. Um, Okay, uh, I need two more answers at least. Yep, there's another one. Many years ago, one volcano erupted and uh, then the temperature of Earth uh, decreased uh, by, uh, by a very big uh, number. So I think maybe we should uh, imitate uh, an eruption of volcano some way. Mm -hmm. So, um, simulate volcano. <coughs> okay. Very interesting idea. It's like another idea. We should use those aerosols. Aerosols, and there's one more here. Recycle rather than burn. <coughs> okay. So, recycle rather than burn. Okay. Okay. Now, there is a a more difficult question, all right? How much of a reduction in CO2 will each one of these cause? Uh, and will that reduction in CO2 be achieved in the seven year period to reduce the temperature by two degrees centigrade? So unfortunately, you know, if you ask politicians about this, they don't really have ideas. They just want to get elected, all right? So we have to look to scientists to answer these questions properly. And this is David Mackay, who is an expert on information theory. So many of you are from IT, right? And information theory is the basis of information technology. And he wrote this world famous book, Information Theory, Inference and Learning Algorithms. So he's a, he was a leading expert. He has passed away. He died early from cancer. But one day he was watching the news. And there was a story that if you leave your telephone chargers plugged in, then that consumes too much energy. And we shouldn't do that. And he knew from his basis in information theory that that is a negligible amount of electricity, right? It cannot change the world by unplugging telephone chargers. So he decided to create a course in which you put numbers on each one of these ideas. Uh, more fuel efficient cars. Uh, the volcano part wasn't there, but it's interesting. And aerosols to stop uh, the, uh, somehow cause a drop in temperature and recycling of all sorts. So he was so passionate about this. He came to me one day, 
while I was eating lunch and he said, drop all your research. Stop doing all your research. This is the most important problem in the world today. All right? So he completely and totally committed himself to helping to solve this problem and to introduce facts. You know, that means true statements in this whole discussion. And he wrote this book, which is a very popular book. And you can download this free of charge. You know, just search for the title and you can download it. And Bill Gates, for example, he bought 2,000 copies of this book to distribute them. Now, what is important about this book? It actually puts numbers on every scenario. That means if you say, okay, uh, we, we know that a volcanic eruption reduce the temperature, can we artificially do that? Uh, and how much will that uh, get to a reduction in temperature? So he did that, and he produced a very simple global calculator for each one of these uh, scenarios like build more nuclear reactors, more wind turbines, more solar cells, and so on. So governments could then calculate, you know, what are the consequences of making changes, okay? Now, the conclusion from that global calculator was that it doesn't matter how many nuclear reactors you build, or how many wind turbines you build, or how much solar power you introduce, they will not produce enough of a reduction in CO2 to solve the problem in seven years. And there is only one method by which you could very quickly reduce the CO2 content. Now, I'm going to tell you what that method is, okay? And you can download the global calculator and do the calculations yourself. And you may not like it. Right? You may not like the suggestion, and I want you to make a comment on whether you would be comfortable with implementing that idea or not. And the idea is very simple. If all of us became vegetarians, okay, you stopped eating meat, then there would be a massive reduction in carbon dioxide in a very short period of time. Okay? So, do you think this is the right way forward? My question to you. Would you be comfortable with... Uh, won't this require... Hmm. Uh, won't this require just small rebuilding of uh, food production? Hmm. So it may increase the facility of work, working time. Yeah. So that's a very good point. Uh, you know, to change would require a lot of uh, change in food production. But if you go to Canada, you know, and you see vast fields of corn production and wheat production, they are not going for human beings. They are going for animal feed. And that is why the process is so inefficient. To produce meat is extremely inefficient compared with producing plants. It would be very easy to switch to uh, food production based on vegetables alone. Because right now, vast quantities are simply fed to animals, which is a secondary production and therefore is inefficient. Okay, so uh, one, one problem was that, um, you know, switching of food production. Any other point? Over there. This idea is uh, very good, but sounds a bit like communism, I think. Uh, it's utopia. We can't change the food habit mm. very fast, uh, very fast. So uh, idea is good, but uh, what about the realization of this idea? Mm. So, so um, this is a, a communist idea. Mm. Yeah. No, I, I think you know, communism has a general meaning, not a political meaning. Communism means that you all cooperate in doing something together. Uh, so people don't like to be forced. Yeah? <coughs> Say it in Russian. Say it in Russian. Деньги, 
translate it for me? Uh, so we should hope that uh, we can change people's beliefs uh, very fast, and uh, that the exception, that the, the point of view cannot be taken by all people, especially if we're talking about the government, for example, that it's a profitable thing for medicine, for mm -hmm. different fields, to, uh, uh, to, to, for people to be ill, and we choose to buy these products like drugs, whatever, and mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not profitable for the government. Very good. So meat production is a big business. Okay. We can rub some things out. Okay. Yeah. Meat meat production is a big business, and also, you know, um, there are political views, and it's very hard to persuade people, right? Mm, I'm not sure if it's correct, but why won't why won't we take a step further and change go to synthetic food? Change the food production at all, not like by growing animals or growing mm. plants, but uh, mm. using chemical way because science is great and mm. very yeah, uh, synthetic foods. Okay, okay. So you have something more? Yeah, sure. What about people who are allergic to vegetables, mm -hmm. fruits? Correct. Allergies, right? Allergies. Okay, so you can see that it's a. Uh, okay, one more. Yep. Um, when you made the issue of uh, quick uh, purchasing procedures uh, of my brother for a sheep, just a minute to show me so that's a manyasa. It's a particular person who has an accent. When you publish a newspaper, a little t shirt, the guy that you sent, I think, a week. So um, the vegetarian diet, all right? Okay, so, so you can see this is a, a yeah, one more. Hmm? Uh, yeah, we have two more things to do. I have two questions. What is it, look, the school in the health of the school, he asked us all your questions. It's a big question. Uh, there is a piece of advice from the audience, hmm. uh, from the vegetarian girl, that uh, we can watch the school of uh, Michael Kareski. Michael Sovieta, who is talking about the experiment of vegetables and meat. Right. Uh, so that would be okay. a piece of advice for me. Okay, so, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, so let's um, let's think about this. Okay. So, my original question was, you know, the the Russian government is putting um, um, sixty billion dollars into environmental research. Okay, and universities are supposed to do something for this. And a simple calculation, uh, and of course, other governments are doing the same. Simple calculation shows that none of these ideas, like making photovoltaic cells more efficient and so on, none of these ideas will solve the problem within the time scale required. And there are big issues, you know, you can't force people, right? So how do you, how do you actually convince people? Well, you know, if you think about it very carefully, the lives of about one billion people will be very badly affected if we get to a temperature rise greater than two degrees centigrade, and there will be wars. You know, there are already aggressive actions because of water shortage in many parts of the world, and, and so on. So we have to balance, balance. I don't have any answers, right? We have to balance clear, logical advice, which has now been adopted by the United Nations, okay, that we should switch to a vegetarian diet, clear, objective advice, which cannot be challenged by science, right? Because it's a quantitative analysis. 
against uh, persuading people about what is the right thing to do. In ethics, there are never very clear answers, okay? So, so for example, you know, what are the dangers of vegetarian diets and do you have allergies? Well, what are the dangers of non-vegetarian diets and allergies from that and so on? So you can argue actually, if you put passion into it, you can argue what is the right way forward. So do you see what I mean by ethics not being completely objective? You have to have different opinions because you come from different backgrounds and so on. Interesting? Okay, let's move on. So the problem would be solved if we switch to an entirely plant-based uh, diet. Let me just remove my jacket, okay, because I'm getting hot. <coughs> this is a global warming contributing. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm going to give you two examples of what you might think is unethical science, okay? So, around 1937, there was a, a Nazi doctor right, who took the bodies of executed prisoners and did very detailed ana anatomical drawings. These are by far the most detailed anatomical drawings available in the whole world. All right? There's be not been anything since then, uh, but he used uh, executed prisoners to make this atlas, okay? And the atlas is being used today by surgeons because it is so detailed that the information from that can be used to help people who are alive. Now, do you feel comfortable with this? Do you think there's anything wrong or right with doing this? So give me some answers. You can answer from that side. We've got another person there, okay, who can help translate. So feel free to ask the question or make a comment in Russian. So is it the right thing to do to use information that has been obtained by cruelty? So that's a good question. So the prisoners were executed already. Yeah, so what's the problem? Yeah. Um, maybe we can write that comment. Yeah, here. So it, uh, it's essential to make progress in medicine. I think uh, it might have been unethical indeed, but uh, in the end, uh, German based medicine is considered the best in the world, isn't it? So hmm. I think it might have, been, might have well been worth it. Hmm. So Germany has uh, admitted crimes. Okay. okay, so let's just look at these three points. Uh, the prisoners were already executed. Now, is it possible that more prisoners were executed because they needed the bodies to make the drawings? We don't know, okay? And the development of medicine, uh, you, can, you can think, yes, it has helped the development of medicine. Uh, so does this encourage other people to do unethical things in order to develop medicine. And one, one example could be that, you know, many cosmetics use really cruel animal treatments. Should we do that? Okay. And the third thing is a very good point that, you know, uh, Germany has been open about its uh, 
Nazi era and therefore should be used this material. Okay, so uh, these were from bodies of executed prisoners uh, dissected by a Nazi surgeon. And these are comments from different uh, pro professors. So from a surgeon uh, that this is a lady and she was uncomfortable about using these drawings but she could not do her job without it. Okay, so that's a justification that a real living patient, she needed to find a particular nerve and she could only do that by looking at this atlas. Okay. Then there's a professor that this atlas represented real evil but it can be used for good. It exists already and it can be used for good. And another one uh, which says, uh, use it to save human lives. But the history of the atlas, when you use it, it must be explained. That means if you use it and the people using it should have the knowledge of how it was created. All right? And finally, you know, this is really interesting comment and uh, it's by an academic that not using it, the atlas would be lost and no one would remember what happened. Okay. So this is what you call a pragmatic view, that this has happened. Okay. Nevertheless, this atlas represents one of the best anatomical set of drawings, and it is being used to save lives, and as long as we acknowledge that it was created in those circumstances, we should use it. Okay. So this is what we call pragmatic if you can write the word pragmatic, that means we are being a, a little bit philosophical about its use. And uh, you know, the comments that are made are exactly uh, like those made by the academics. And here's another example. This is von Braun, who was a German rocket scientist who, uh, who was a member of the Nazi party. And he created the V2 rockets, which indiscriminately bombed the UK. You know. So these were not very clever rockets, so they would land anywhere where civilians were, for example. They were not directed at military targets. And uh, he was also friendly with uh, this person who uh, used slave labor to make these uh, rockets. Okay? Now, after the Second World War, um, Braun and 1,600 other Germans were secretly taken to the US. Right, because they wanted to make rockets. And indeed, uh, uh, von Braun was responsible for the creation of the Saturn V rocket for the moon pr landing program. And he was elected to the National Academy of Engineering, and he was even given the National Medal of Science. So his past was swept under the carpet because uh, they wanted to get his technology. Now, how does this compare with the case previously of using the atlas by surgeons? Is this the right thing to, for the US to have done? Question. Yeah, I think you raised it. Uh, okay. <laughs> Give me an answer. So here, this is a different scenario. We are not saving human lives, OK? Microphone, excuse me. Okay, so that's a good point. That again underlined the pragmatic, mm -hmm. pragmatic view. <coughs> yep. Well, I'm not sure if it's connected with Atlas, but with robots, uh, invention of robots can be used for space, for mining rocks. So imagine every time an uh, eruption like was suggested before. So it's actually the guilt of how you use the rocket is mm. not only in the inventor, but others like armies. Mm. Missiles, for example. 
there was somebody else. Я думаю, мы должны разделять прошлое человека и то, что он вкладывает в науку. То есть он должен понести наказание за те деяния, которые сделал против человечества, но должен возместить тот ущерб, который он ему нанес, тем, что даст какие-то свои знания и наработки. Мы вот по поводу прошлого примера с нацистским врачом. Как вы считаете, если бы он не был его достижения в науке по-другому воспринимались? If he is guilty for the actions in the past, he should be responsible. And we have the question about the previous slide about the atlas. Uh, whether it is okay that uh, we discriminate the person because of his nationality, hmm. and if he was, uh, if he had been not, uh, so would he be guilty or not? It's a good question because uh, in a war you actually want to destroy your enemy. So if it was another nationality making the rockets to bomb civilians, uh, would that be different? I don't know. But the conclusion I'm getting from everybody is that you know, as long as he is punished for what he did in the past, we can adopt a pragmatic view. Of course he wasn't punished. He was, in fact, elected to the National Academy of Engineering in the US and given the National Medal of Science. But let's assume that we have a pragmatic view, okay? And we, we know that he has technology and we'll take that technology. Okay. So you see how difficult ethical issues are, okay? Right. So there's a pragmatic approach. The two cases are simple to assess with a balance between a pragmatic approach to need and the association with evil. I'm going to show you a much more modern case, uh, which is different and really quite shocking, perhaps. Okay? So this happened very recently. So this is a, a Chinese uh, scientist, and he's giving a talk here uh, in the Royal Society. You can see the Royal Society and the National Academy of Sciences. So these are very respectable science academies. And he is the first person in the world to have created two genetically modified human beings. Okay. The first person in the world to have created two genetically modified human beings and we will call them Lulu and Nana. Two babies. Right. And his aim was to stop the babies from inheriting uh, AIDS, uh, HIV, from the father. Right? So by making a genetic modification, uh, his science told him that the babies would not inherit AIDS. So on the face of it, the motivation sounds very good. And, uh, you know, the U.S. had uh, rules of ethics on genetic modification of human beings. And basically, you know, if there is no other method of treating a patient who is not going to survive, then you can try an experiment <coughs> on that patient with stem cells and genetic modification and so on. So that was a very general rule of ethics in the, in the U.S. On, on such science. But after this work, because these rules were too general, they are subject to a lot of interpretation. So there is now a lot of work going on to change those rules because it is not acceptable to genetically modify the human being because we do not understand the full consequences. You know, if you are just stopping the AIDS problem, there might be other issues created as a consequence of genetic modification, which we don't know about. Right? So we are not as clever as we think, and we may not know of other consequences of genetic modification. And there are 
there is the involvement of scientists from the US and from China on this particular experiment. All right. So, uh, the scientists were from Stanford and their internal investigation exonerated them. That means they were found not guilty of participating in this experiment. Okay? Uh, although, you know, when you look at uh, respectable journals and they report what was happening, there is a clear sort of <coughs> encouragement of this work. And there's not much known about how the Chinese investigated this, although they have fired the scientist concerned, right? Uh, because apparently he had consent from the hospital and from the parents to do this. But the real point is that we don't know exactly what happened. So both Stanford, Stanford has not opened up its investigation, so we don't know actually what they investigated, right? And the Chinese are not giving any information about this, right? So the problem is, for me to believe whether this was ethical or unethical, I need to know the facts. Because one basic principle about ethics is that you should be transparent. And neither Stanford nor the Chinese have been transparent about actually what happened. Now, here's a difficult question. Um, there are now two genetically edited human beings. And we don't know whether the editing of their genes did exactly what the scientists wanted or were there more consequences. Okay. So, should we study the babies? That's my question. Is it ethical to now study the babies? It's exactly like the case of the anatomical atlas and the Rocket, where you all, uh, where most of you agreed that the pragmatic solution. Here, these are real living human beings. Should we now study the babies? So it's a gentle monitoring, okay? Uh, and supposing you find, <coughs> supposing you find from this monitoring that they're growing three hands all of a sudden, what do you do? Any, any other comments? This is important. I know it's a very difficult thing to think about. Yeah, here's one. Here. Okay, uh, later. I think uh, I think the deed was done. The deed is uh, the baby's genes have been modified, and there would be no point to leave them as they are. They need to be studied, even if it might be unethical. They need to be studied. They need to be. Uh, we need to know how to treat them if something if something goes wrong. Uh, it's uh, genetic modification is uh, an entirely new kind of science field. I think it's like space. We have to we have to take you know, the, the scientist approach and hmm. investigate and uh, explore. Okay, so that's a, a good point. The deed has been done. Uh, there's another point here. Uh, so this is completely unethical, but uh, the scientists should 
spend in his Vegas in order to find out uh, what consequences of this food is like, like uh, what consequences mm. of this genetic, uh, genetic modification uh, will lead to. And uh, we cannot know for sure whether it, uh, there will be the third kind or there will be not, but still we should study this. Mm. So we, we should study, okay. Okay, so. Um, we have some more people. Oh, sorry. So they might need special care. So I think I think those are all very good points. Uh, what yes, one for? So uh, would it be unethical to leave these children without any control because they can die mm. because of you know? So this is an important point. Is it unethical not to study them because they might be suffering, right? Okay. So I'm just yeah. Yeah, so that's a very important point, okay? Uh, so these experiments have been done, but we should create much more rigorous rules for such experiments. Because these two babies are innocent, and with the permission of their parents, you know, there should be some gentle monitoring because you don't want them to suffer. Yeah, so as long as we have permission from the parents, or if the babies grow to be old enough to give the permission, that would be a good thing to do. It's quite a strange question because you can make a decision to give a permission for it yourself only when you are adult. But when you are adult, you can't modify your genes yeah. anymore. So Correct. Yeah. So, so I think, I think this should not happen again. That is for sure, that somebody goes away and does an experiment. And the problem with this was that there was absolutely no transparency. That means the scientists basically did them without permission from the university, keeping it secret until it's announced at a conference, and so on. So everything should have complete transparency in what you're doing. That means people should be able to see and comment on what you're doing. And any information that you produce uh, should have open access, open data, open algorithms, so that you can see what's inside uh, these experiments that are going on. So nowadays, when you publish a paper, you can make it open access. That means you pay a certain amount to the journal, and they will allow completely free access all over the world, right? So that's, that's an ethical solution to stopping secret research, all right? Um, and, you know, you only do secret research because you want to win the Nobel Prize or something like that. Uh, it should be completely transparent when you're doing something risky, uh, which will affect uh, the lives of human beings. And, you know, if you look at the work of Newton, 
you can find all his experimental data. All right? You can find his books, you can find everything. But for a modern scientist, you won't be able to do that. Okay? So we have all the information of the experiments and uh, writings that Newton did, but a modern scientist's work is not accessible because they don't make the data available. Is that right? You're right, in the case of those two babies, it still needs to be open to international scrutiny, not, uh, for example, just Chinese government. Yeah, it needs to be open to international scrutiny. Um, we don't want anything hidden. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, you are IT people, and, uh, you know, you will create some algorithms and it's necessary also for you to make the source code available if it's not uh, of commercial value. So, for example, this is a paper that was published recently and you can com completely freely download the paper and you can download absolutely all the experimental data associated, 34 gigabytes of information. So the internet now makes it possible for you to behave like Newton. That means you keep all your records and you make them available. This would not be possible without the internet because uh, the amount of science that's done now is orders of magnitude greater than in the days of Newton. Okay? And similarly, you know, there are libraries of algorithms which are freely available. So, you don't, uh, so one of the fundamental principles in publication, fun absolutely fundamental principles, is that your work must be capable of being reproduced by somebody else. If you cannot do that, that means there's something wrong. You've either made up the data or, you know, something is fundamentally wrong if it cannot be reproduced. Now, these days we write many computer algorithms which are too big to publish inside a paper. And therefore, when somebody else wants to check your work, it's impossible for them to check unless you make the actual algorithms and the source code available. So there are now mechanisms by which you can do that. This, is a, this specific library is a materials algorithms project where people can put their libraries with a minimum level of documentation and scientific literature. Okay. So by making things transparent, there is less of a chance of fraud in publication and also you lead to greater progress. <coughs> Okay, so let's go back to this particular case. Uh, uh, another um, journal, The Economist, analyzed this case and said, look, this scientist, should we regard him as a maverick? Uh, maverick, all right? And maverick means unorthodox or independent-minded person who really believes in what they are doing and they're not going to stop at rules to get on with their work. Now, the question is, um, do we need such people in science who are so passionate about their work and they think of all the rules and regulations as stopping them from doing important work? What is your opinion? There's another microphone. An another microphone there. Uh, 
гуманно всех разрешения проводить нежестокие исследования. Мне кажется, это полезные знания и полезные ученые. Если они хотят помочь многим избавиться от таких болезней, как ВИЧ. So the main point is that uh, these studies can help uh, the humanity to avoid several diseases, uh, like to make our lives better, like this uh, genome modified product. Mm. So uh, we should uh, take into consideration the global problem and uh, not just the particular case, and we can study. Uh, Children, uh, hmm. Yeah, so we should take advantage of this uh, study to improve the quality of uh, life and the Okay. Well, uh, I'm not trying to be rude, but I thought that everything should be in moderation. So I don't think that humanity needs people like him because uh, every research uh, can go too far. And uh, it can lead to some things that will harm the whole humanity. Mm. So scientists need controls, okay? Because they are like normal human beings. If the controls are not there, then they will try things which are outside of normal rules. Эксперименты uh, нормальные ученые, ну, если можно выразиться, uh, изучают, и это очень продвигает uh, науку в каких-то сферах, либо дает понять, что в таких направлениях двигаться не надо. Спасибо. So there's a possibility that they can do things which are not allowed with normal scientists. Radiation sickness. <coughs> so, uh, maybe there should be some uh, things that are maybe unethical, but they should be done to uh, uh, when, when the progress. When the progress yes. Okay. Okay. There's a. Uh, so, I'm happy that uh, researchers and science just like. So we will never stop this uh, researches and maybe one guy just uh, hadn't done this research, another one will do. Mm -hmm. And I think the rules were made just to break them. Okay, the rules were made to break them. Okay. Sorry, one more yeah, sure. Translate. So the amount of so consequences I matter. Uh, one more question. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, if we 
not good uh, because uh, there is uh, one more problem about uh, in place uh, for people. So if uh, uh, we will uh, do the next communications, uh, people uh, will be living more uh, longer, and uh, it, it is good uh, for all uh, humanity. Yeah. Yes. I think the science uh, need uh, to these people, but uh, uh, somebody uh, uh, must need to control this uh, uh, bill uh, mm. uh, because, uh, for example, we don't know what the science uh, will do with uh, these children. Yeah, yeah. So, so. Um, So, yep. Ну, я считаю, что такие люди, как он, всегда были, есть и будут. Потому что, ну, как бы, любое исследование, оно рискованно. То есть без риска невозможно ничего. И поэтому, если люди не будут рисковать, то, соответственно, не будет прогресса. И это касается любой науки. Поэтому я считаю, что ограничивать таких людей, как, допустим, этот ученый, просто, ну, не целесообразно. So uh, it's uh, there are always such people like mm. this uh, scientist, and um, that's impossible and unnecessary to control them because uh, every experiment is uh, requires some risk, and mm. uh, uh, without this risk, uh, there is no way to progress. Okay. Yeah, so that's a One kind more. kind of uh, pragmatism, but with some controls. One more, yeah. I think researchers, researchers uh, give uh, to people a long life, a better life. Hmm. Yeah, so there might be some good which comes out of it. Okay, okay. So let's let's just see. Okay. So um, the problem with uh, modern science is that we have got into a mode where we think we are good doing good science because we satisfy the funding authorities, right? So for example, here, uh, it encourages scientists to be conform to regulations, okay? And to meet certain indicators which the gov government and politicians like to emphasize. So for example, you should publish papers. So, you know, just in the last 15 years, there have been 1.4 million papers published on graphene. Now, that is very silly. There are not 1.4 million breakthroughs in graphene, okay? But when you get funding, you must publish, right? That's what the government would say, because you're using money. And you should publish in particular journals, whereas, you know, the Russian uh, mathematician who solved uh, Poincare's conjecture, he simply put his paper on the archive acts. And this was uh, after about 300 years he solved that mathematical problem and he simply put his paper out there. Okay? He wasn't concerned with the impact factor of the journal because the archive acts as zero impact factor. Uh, and uh, peer review itself might be dangerous because you know, referees are acting as if they know the answer. Okay? And then once you're published and so on, you can raise more money and publish more and raise more money. So this is a, a sort of a circular thing that universities throughout the world are stuck in. Right? And to some extent, uh, to some extent, because there is so much money in science, we are not actually doing good science. 
because of this, right? So in that context, maybe we do need some mavericks, and I'll give you an example. This is an interesting person. Uh, he followed a theory which was proposed in 1930 that, you know, if we put iron uh, compounds into the ocean, that will encourage the plankton to produce more oxygen and solve, solve uh, many of the problems that we have, convert CO2 into oxygen. So what he did in 1988 is he took, uh, you know, a couple of hundred tons of iron sulfate and he put it into the ocean uh, in 2012. He dumped 100 tons of iron sulfate into the Pacific Ocean near Canada without consulting anybody, all right? And the idea was to boost the plankton that iron exists on. And of course, he was criticized by the Canadian government. But his argument was, the scientists are just talking. I'm actually doing something, all right? on the basis of science that uh, was available in 1930. I'm actually encouraging the plankton to grow and convert CO2 into oxygen. Okay, so bear this in mind. Just very recently, this year, uh, Cambridge created a center for climate repair, all right, so for repairing the climate. And <laughs> what is the idea that they propose? They propose, look, put iron particles into the sea and get algae to do the job of converting CO2. So that was a maverick scientist, all right, uh, uh, earlier, um, Ross George, a maverick, who decided to do it himself because scientists are just talking. And now in Cambridge we are copying this idea to get more funding for climate repair, okay? So sometimes I think that the system of science that we have, which works on indicators rather than on what is the content of your research, is actually making the whole thing very dull. And we need creative people who think outside of the box. Okay, now this is, uh, this is me when I was a boy. And this is a Volkswagen car. Now, this is one of the biggest scandals I'm going to tell you about in engineering ethics. So, it ar arises because scientists and engineers think they are too clever. So, Volkswagen diesel engines could not meet the environmental regulations on emissions. Okay? So, they perform badly. So what did they do? Instead of trying to solve the problem by better engineering, they created software, you know, IT people, right? Um, they created software so that the car knows when it is being tested. And therefore, it artificially reduces emissions. Okay. But when it's running on the road, the emissions are very high. So this is a, this is a clear example of unethical engineering. Okay, so they're trying to cheat the test system of environmental regulations. And look, the amount of cheating is amazing. So this was the environmental regulation, and these are the data for emissions from a Volkswagen diesel car while it's running. So it clearly is orders of magnitude higher than it should be. And it was uh, discovered by several people. Uh, you know, West, these are data from West Virginia University, but before that, there was a Swedish guy who wrote a paper saying, you know, the emissions during driving are greater than during testing. But nobody noticed that. Now, this is a case of cheating, right? A clear case of cheating. And cheating has grades of cheating. Right. So when you have a very major amount of cheating, the consequences of cheating are also very big. The cost of cheating scales non-linearly with the uh, magnitude of the problem. Okay. So Volkswagen has been subject to many criminal proceedings uh, and uh, the chairman of Volkswagen is in jail. 
tens of billions of pounds in fines all over the world, tens of billions of pounds of fines, okay? Uh, the damage to reputation, you know, German engineering is supposed to be the best in the world. And, you know, I would buy a Volkswagen car before this story uh, because of reliability. But it has had such a reputational damage that actually all diesel uh, car sales have dropped dramatically, you know, by 40% because of this problem. Okay? So, if you cheat, you will be found out in science and engineering. Eventually, you will be found out, and the magnitude of that problem will determine the punishment. And there's an even older story with General Motors. This man wrote a book explaining that this particular car is designed for accidents. Okay, so that means it's so bad that it's, it has accidents and there has been a loss of life. And these are the particular technical details that he put in the book. Many crashes through poor design. And his name is Ralph Nader. And even, even the dashboard design is wrong because it reflects sunlight onto your face. So you can't see what's ahead in the car, uh, in, outside. So what did General Motors do? They did not listen to the technical comments, all right? Instead, they tried to discredit Nader. Uh, they, they tried to investigate his political, social, racial, and religious views. And they send uh, prostitutes to entice him into compromising situations and uh, tapped his phone. None of this succeeded. And in those days, General Motors was fined $425,000. And Nader used this money to create a center for automotive safety. And car safety now is orders of magnitude better than in those days because of Ralph Nader. So, he created a large consumer rights movement. So, you know, if you buy a product which is unsafe and the manufacturer knows that it's unsafe, then there will be very major consequences. Okay. So, this is really, really very good investigative work done by an ordinary person. Okay. So, it's possible to do this. Science journalism. Um, so, most journalists do not actually understand the science that they are reporting. Okay? And this is a story which is really bad. And it says that, look, um, graphene is 200 times stronger than steel. Everywhere on the internet you will find this statement. And just two weeks ago there was a professor who contacted me and said, look, uh, can we make a space elevator from graphene? Okay? Because that's a Russian idea from a comic. Of course, they haven't learned from carbon nanotubes, which had the same story. And this is the Design Museum in uh, London, which says, you know, it's 200 times stronger than steel. So, this misinformation is being given to journalists by universities. So, here is the Manchester University website, which says graphene is 200 times stronger than steel. Very elementary mathematics, all right? The strongest ion is 14.5 gigapascals in strength. So one pascal is the uh, weight, uh, weight of one apple on one square meter, all right? So this is uh, 14 and a half billion apples on one square meter. That's how strong one piece of iron can be. So if you take the strength of graphene, which is the carbon-carbon bond, and you divide by the strength of iron, then it's only nine times stronger than steel. But that's not where the story ends, because strength depends on size. Graphene is only about two micrometers in size. If you scale it up, it has zero strength because of the defects, all right? So it is unethical to quote the strength of something as small and compare with the strength of something where it's large. But, unfortunately, science journalists no longer investigate these things properly. And here you are, you know, nanotubes and so on and so on. Elevators into space and uh, R Richard Branson uh, said, look, we are going to make an aircraft from graphene in the near future. 
So you put out this misinformation in order to get funding, right? But it is unethical to do that without doing proper science. Now, this is a, a nice story. Uh, a crystal, by definition, is periodic. So if I draw this cube, and I simply repeat that cube so that it fills all space, then I know the position of every atom inside a large object, right? Because it is a periodic structure. And if you look uh, at the mathematics of making a regular arrangement, you can never get a five-fold axis of symmetry. You can get a, if you rotate by 180 degrees, you can recover the structure, or rotate by 90 degrees, you can recover the structure, but you can never get a five-fold axis of symmetry. All right? So it's a very basic uh, uh, principle. You can get a two-fold axis of symmetry, four-fold, three-fold, uh, but not uh, six-fold, but not five-fold. So there was a, a scientist called Dan Shackman here. Uh, you know, Joe, who is sitting over there, is good friends with him. They exchange jokes over WhatsApp. So he discovered regular diffraction patterns which are inconsistent with a periodic structure, right? So he discovered, you know, five-fold and ten-fold electron diffraction patterns. Never before had that been discovered, right? So this was uh, while he was in the US. And because it is such a different idea, Linus Pauling, who won two Nobel Prizes, was totally against this idea. And he called, called Dan Shackman derisory names. He said, you are not a scientist, you are a quasi-scientist. And then his research group said, look, uh, go back and read a textbook. You are bringing disgrace to our, uh, our unit. And they effectively fired him. All right? So this is a scientist who had experimental data which could not be explained by conventional theory, and he was fired as a consequence. But he won the Nobel Prize for his discovery, okay? And um, he demonstrated that it's possible, to, uh, he and um, actually another person called John Kahn demonstrated that it's possible to have a pattern that fills space but lacks translational symmetry, right? So Dan Shackman was violently attacked by polling. Yeah, with lots of letters to journals, derisory comments at conferences, but he knew, he knew his work, and he stuck to his guns, and he paid by being fired from uh, a group in the US, but he was given the Nobel Prize for his work, because we now understand that in an aperiodic structure, we can get five-fold symmetry. So should academics be violently criticized for having different views? There's a very basic principle in universities is that you must have academic freedom. So if you discover something which you know, the uh, rector of the university doesn't agree with, you still can't be fired. Right? That should be a basic principle. This is a case in Cambridge. Right? So this is a, a, scient a sociologist who got his PhD from Oxford University. And he was uh, appointed. Uh, in Cambridge University to do his research. 500 academics signed a letter saying he should not be, he should be fired, all right? And it's because of his relationships on race, criminality, and genetic intelligence. So he was, he was producing theories which said, you know, certain races are more intelligent than others, uh, or words to that effect, right? Now, the question is, does it matter that 500 academics write a letter to the university saying he should not be employed? What is your opinion? How should you assess this case? Uh, well, I don't think that it matters because everybody got their point and they just need time to prove. Mm -hmm. So proof is the solution. We had student protests, you know, in the university that he should not be employed. Do you think that writing letters like this from 500 academics is the right way forward? 
Well, you know, there was a book published during the Second World War. It was called A Hundred German Scientists Against Einstein. Right? So a reporter asked Einstein, you know, uh, what do you think about this book? He said, well, if one of them was right, there would be no problem. You don't need a hundred scientists to say this, okay? So just writing a letter that this guy has done bad research and therefore should be fired doesn't make sense, you know? Um, he should be allowed to do his research, and if his research is not good, then it will come out, obviously, from reading the papers. And the reason why I know of this case is because I, I heard about it, and he was, in fact, fired, actually. Uh, they initiated an investigation, but then 600 academics wrote a letter saying he should not be fired, <laughs> okay? Um, so the signing of letters is not a very helpful thing to do because you cannot judge science by democracy by saying, look, a thousand people have signed this letter, so you should fire him. You cannot judge scientific issues like that. And uh, indeed, uh, my own student came to me and said, look, there is this guy who is doing... Uh, racist research, uh, you know. So I said to him, look, uh, he should be allowed to do his research and, you know, if he's doing bad research, he will dig his own hole deeper and deeper. But there is a fundamental principle of academic freedom that should be respected. Um, in Cambridge University, uh, there was a lecture by an organization which supports men and boys. In other words, uh, you know, an anti-feminist movement. Okay. And then there were, again, protests with 240 people signing a letter. And the university issued a statement that the lawful expression of controversial or unpopular unpo views is not grounds for withholding permission. That means as long as you're doing something lawful, you are allowed to say things. Okay. But if you are saying, you know, these people should be killed, that's not allowed. All right. So... The basic principle of academic freedom is that, you know, as long as you're following the law, even if you have controversial views, you should be able to express them. This is just a story that I do. There are many other ethical issues. For example, you know, if you are a consultant, you are going to be paid for giving your opinion. Okay? So, are you going to be biased by that payment in giving an opinion which is favorable to your organization? And we are here today as members of the International Scientific Advisory Committee of MISIS. All right? Now, I want you to pay attention to the fact that we are advisory. We do not dictate what MISIS should do, but we advise. Okay? And the university is completely free to ignore our opinions. Okay? But if they ignore too many of our opinions, then obviously we are not doing a useful thing and we would leave. So, so there are many, many um, ethical issues, even in operating on a committee which is advisory. Yeah. Obviously, no, nobody actually knows completely the right way forward, but by normal discussion, and uh, we can reach some conclusions. Okay? So that is the end of my talk, and I'm really delighted uh, at the way in which you participated in this uh, lecture, because I was afraid that I would just be talking and students would be shy, but you have demonstrated that you are actually thinking people, okay? So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.